So I have a unique privilege to recognize and honor on behalf of so many fellows, fellows in the room and those who love him, the great Keith Bowick. Keith will shortly join me on stage for an interview, but before he does that, I'd like to say a few words about him. Keith has a long, impressive, and very interesting resume, which is worth a read, spanning from a PhD in history to interviewing Alfred Hitchcock and winning three Emmy Awards for his television program at One With, playing stand-up bass, running 93 marathons, the first one of which he ran at age 49, but as it relates to this fellowship, it is really his decision to take on the position of executive director of the then nascent program, the Henry Crown Fellowship, in 1996 that changed lives for all of us. That single catalytic act of taking on crafting and molding the program and putting together the first classes set in motion a series of events which led to what exists today an Aspen Global Leadership Network, 14 programs, now over 3,000 fellows strong across 70 countries, and it all started with the Henry Crown Fellowship. Keith was joined by Skip Battle and Ben Dunlap in launching, moderating the first 10 classes, forming the Jedi Triad of original moderators, the greats, in forging the intergalactic army of the just, us, and growing. He later went on with Skip and Peter Reiling to develop and moderate many of the programs across the world, including the Fellowship in Education, Pahara, and the Fellowship on, on the Environment, Cato. Together, he and I moderate the Pursuing the Good Life alumni seminar, having its first session uh, as us as a pair in 2008 in Spear, South Africa. He also holds countless reunion seminars that spun off from almost every single class where fellows travel across the world for guidance and, and the reverent practice of soul tending. Having to face ourselves, asking difficult and sometimes troubling questions, not letting us off the hook if we try to stay in the shallows and helping us on our journey of self-discovery. He lives his life as an example, not on the sidelines, beautifully, imperfectly, and with unabashed sentiment brave vulnerability, and love, connecting us all in this essence, grounding this fellowship in a secular but unmistakable spirituality. I am sure that one day we will look back and we will remark with incredulity that how can it be that one such as he walked amongst us? I do not think at all that this is a grandiose observation, as these are the sorts of references that are made of people who usually live a life in great service of others. They have figured out the importance of interconnectivity. They have transformed themselves into veritable fountains and are happy to have others come and drink. They themselves being nourished by some immeasurable source. You are always impacted having engaged with them and you feel somehow a great sense of belonging so essential to our human existence. Their care of others is vital to their own survival. They are the great humanists and none other more so than Keith. In the enterprise of the Henry Crown Fellowship, we must acknowledge Martha Lang. She supported these efforts for 18 years. The tender loving care with which she effectively and efficiently takes on all she does has been imprinted in the fellowship and runs in the blood of its veins and by extension through the veins of this entire fellowship. A quiet and vital pelagia. So essential, but if we do not take care, often overlooked, but the one cannot exist without the other. Please stand up, Martha, so that we can recognize you. <laughs> Hi. 
How can we talk about Keith without mentioning his equal in vitality, in exploration, and in depth, the love of his life, Sheena? The two are a pair, and you know the one more fully by getting to know the other. An enduring love marked by on-the-spot honesty, deep love and concern for the other, and a true, living, thriving example of freedom in togetherness. She is steady in her step, has an unpracticed flair. She is the balm to his heart, his mind, and his soul. Sheena completed her PhD and on a subject called Written Beauty in Literature and the Mind. If you are lucky enough to have a, con a conversation with Sheena, the cues are long and the exchange captivating. You will probably learn something about beauty and its ability to help us transcend the self and even connect with divinity. Please stand, Sheila, so we can acknowledge you in all your beauty. These people have played a significant role in what we are beneficiaries of today, the essence in the DNA of this fellowship. African elephants retrace ancient roots across the continent. The elders of the herd pass on their essential wisdom to younger generations, where to seek refuge, where to be nourished, and how to survive as a species. Keith, you are our elder, ever ready to show us what you have learned and guide us to our own realizations. The elephants link wildlife systems as they move. They bring important information about where they come from and connect diverse species that enrich and strengthen the entire ecosystem. Conservationists say that when you look after the elephant, you end up caring for the entire environment, right down to the tiny dung beetle. To care for the key species is vital to our survival. And elephants cross borders. <laughs> they move across boundaries. In fact, whole governments have to cooperate and collaborate to allow their passage, recognizing the importance of protecting them, the value of what they bring and do, and the importance of their wisdom. You connect us, Keith. You carry the essential essence of love across the borders. Whole governments will have to cooperate when the full power of love and connectedness fully fueling the good and deliberate deeds of this fellowship finally stirs in the world. I came to know Keith when he, Skip, and Peter Riling moderated our class. Later on our way back to the airport from moderated training in a separate event, Keith asked me what I was reading and interested in. Just emerging from a divorce at a really young age, I realize now, uh, and having read every conceivable self-help, religious, mystical, alternative healing book and, and author I could lay my hands on, I gave what I thought was the Aspen answer and listed off all the finance, business, and current affairs titles I had had to read for my work, leaning toward me with a curled finger on his lip. He kept listening, and then we started to talk. That led to the first pursuing of the Good Life Seminar in 2008, and it's been a 12-year journey. We have, come to be, we have come to be each other's mirror and each other's other. The journey will never stop for me, and it never stops for him, as this journey of self-discovery will never stop for any of us, and the excitement of, of it is perhaps best expressed in the words as he relates to it in his own process of becoming. The best is yet to come. Keith, please join me on the stage.
and to city as a use. So, Keith, I'm going to ask you a few questions and we'll have a conversation. What were your hopes and ambitions for the fellowship at the time that you stepped in in 1996? Well, <laughs> the wheels were coming off the truck and it wasn't out of the garage yet, so that it, it was a, a, a kind of rescue operation for something that had gotten stalled and I got a call from Jim O'Toole who every once in a while would tell me he had a little problem, so he asked me if I'd come and, and help set this right. And uh, so I was enlisted in that uh, goal and I realized there had to be a little bit of demolition and then we would get on with it. My aspiration first was to get it started. Bill Mayer cared a great deal about getting this program started and Muriel and Francis Hoffman, who are the real founders of this fellowship, uh, were pressing to get it off the ground because they felt a great urgency and importance about the mission. And I took that mission very seriously. They were trying to uh, establish meaningful philanthropy for a whole generation of people, particularly in the Silicon Valley and other such places, uh, who were uh, becoming enormously wealthy without, as they perceived it, uh, very much commitment to, to uh, social service or to uh, uh, to leveraging their privileged position for the good. So that was uh, the mission at the outset, using all of the tradition of this extraordinary institution over the years. And then it was to deal with a problem that had always had existed. You had this, um, this descendants from Aristotle to Adler, Mortimer Adler to O'Toole, who who revised the executive seminar, and now to Trey Breifogel. And uh, the proposition was that you were going to try to create the conditions of the good society. You had the executive seminar, which was the, the core program of the Aspen Institute, but they were never successful in getting anything beyond that that, that had lasting power. And so it seemed to us that uh, the Henry Crown Fellowship and whatever offshoots of it uh, would be able to solve the problem of continuity and therefore general meaning. Uh, so the idea of, of four uh, seminars over the course of two years and ultimately in many cases in 18 months uh, was extraordinarily important. And for me personally, my aspiration was that the definition of leadership instead of being totally uh, uh, concentrated on effectiveness as taught in schools of business, would incorporate genuine enlightenment and enlightenment for the good and take thought leading to action so that it would have an active ingredient in it. And therefore, one of the things that we built into it was not only four seminars so that we could think deep thoughts and apply those to our leadership challenges, but in particular that we would then take that and, and indulge in what a project that would be a practicum uh, in the values that you've been speaking about. And so that was, the, that was the formula. For me personally, it was a matter of the heart. I thought that what was missing in much of leadership, after all, we have type A people who are action oriented, uh, and that is, uh, they, it was clear that they should be, if not practicing entrepreneurs, at least have entrepreneurial capacity, meaning that uh, they were not risk averse and uh, they wanted to take action. Uh, and that was all well and good. And they were enormously successful at an early stage of their careers for whatever kind of reason whether dumb luck, whether family, whether uh, affirmative action, whatever it was. Uh, but I thought that it was incredibly important that they also uh, take note of kindness, friendship, compassion, love. 
And I will answer this question for you, <laughs> because the, the word lum comes up over and over again, of, often in a kind of soupy way. I believe that love has a tensile strength that is just as the strength of 10 or 100 or 1,000, and that it is one of the absolute, in, uh, absolute essentials in the mission of values-based leadership. Uh, so we would bring these folks up, and my, uh, I also felt that we would be derelict if this was not a true multicultural group of people uh, with as great a diversity of angles of vision as possible, given that you had this subset of the population that's type A and has, you know, uh, fundamentally narcissism runs rather swiftly. <laughs> And, and in my own case, quite persistently. <laughs> I, I, one of the things that I discovered was that my, my various misadventures in life, with your many, uh, had a certain resonance for the members of this <laughs> fellowship. And they came up. It became a kind of the, a part of the magic, because my vulnerability is very clear. And, and uh, uh, so, okay. <laughs> so I found, to my astonishment, that my misadventures had not only a resonance, but they became a part of the curriculum, as it so were. So that, that's, a, that's a good place to, to segue into an, another idea. What is the act or the process of soul tending? Well, the Jesuits, of course, have done this. Uh, I am not a Jesuit. I, I, I'm not a practicing religionist, except uh, the religion of the mind and the spirit and the body, body, mind, and spirit, the great trinity of the Aspen Institute. Uh, but what's the question? <laughs> what is soul tending? Yes. The thing that the Jesuits have always been. Well, I believe that what we have to do is first tend to our own soul. We have to take an interior journey and have a, an internal conversation with our soul when it's telling us the truth. And then we have to take an assessment, a self-assessment. I have certainly done this, and I continue to do it. It's a, an ongoing practice of uh, considering what are the masks that we wear? How do we present ourselves in the various roles that we play? And we all play many roles. So one of the first things we ask the fellows to do is take the mask off and present yourself, be vulnerable, accessible, open. And I think if you can be in contact with your own soul and then seek to align the outer with the inner, you have a prescription uh, for an ongoing relevance and therefore the possibility of creating an atmosphere in which learning and love are irresistible. That's been my aim for my whole life long. Thank you, Keith. And, and so the soul tending seems to me that when we come together, we come to know one another in deep and intimate ways, in revealing in the circle of trust and confidentiality things that normally are never revealed uh, to the outside world. And there is a sacredness about the, and a sanctity about that circle of trust. And uh, and then, to an extraordinary degree, that inaugural class had all kinds of precedents, one of which has been extremely me meaningful. They decided, that the night of their so-called graduation, that they would meet every year thereafter. Mm -hmm. And I promised that I would be available for them if I could possibly do it in my schedule for every year. They have met every year so far. Sometimes they come out to Santa Barbara and do it there, and uh, Sheena and uh, my two direct reports, I report to Gina, I report to Martha, and I report to you. You do. Uh, <laughs> and they, they put on uh, just an extraordinary 90th birthday party uh, for me in which people came from all over the world, people came from my past lives, people came from the community that I had uh, I, I spent much less time there than I did traveling the world okay. uh, for this. So Keith, I, 
Yeah. In, in the Summit magazine that we, we received in our arrival packs, there's a spread that covers you, and it refers to your practice of embracing the other. Yes. What does this mean, and why is it so vital to your existence? Well, the little pieces in the, in the Summit magazine, and actually I was invited uh, to by the editors, to, uh, Phil Havayana uh, and uh, Kid Solomon, to write a piece on the moderating of the other, which is uh, uh, Borges's quite extraordinary story, which is uh, used in the curriculum. We introduced it back in 2005. And it uh, is the story of Borges himself at age uh, uh, 59, I think it was, uh, who sitting on a bench on the Charles River, it's February, it's cold, there are ice flows there, and he becomes aware of another being. And that turns out to be an apparition of his younger self. And while he knows that he's on the banks of the Charles River, uh, his younger self, who comes into his presence, uh, knows that he's on the Rhone River in Geneva. And the, the, whole, the whole story is how the how he, the elder, tries to get in touch with his younger self. And he knows all kinds of things that happened uh, back in that year and previous years, and of course all the things that have happened mm -hmm. since. But one of the things that he knows is that his father uh, arranged a sexual introduction at a, uh, with a prostitute, and it uh, traumatized him. Mm -hmm. And, and he mentions that. And it's not made evident in the story, but we know it to be true. And so in their effort to establish contact, they simply can't do it. Now, the importance of this uh, in the context of the seminar was that, <laughs> very interestingly, the first class that I moderated uh, was one in which Marianne Bagai was present, and Bill Patterson. Uh, and Bill Patterson, after the discussion of this, uh, came to me and asked what I'd been doing when I was his age. My, I first uh, told him, well, I was an academic. I'm very different from, my life has been very different from all of you high-powered uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, but uh, you know, I was doing academic things and so forth. And then in the evening, I realized that in point of fact, I was breaking away from the academy to lead a, a little humanistic repertory company under the aegis of the humanities development in the three years leading up to the bicentennial of independence. And what an extraordinary experience that was of ordinary people in farms and factories and rotary clubs and you know all of the kinds of associations in small towns under 10,000 in population by some formula of the humanities endowment who were held to be humanistically deprived. And so one of the first things we learned, of course, was that there were humanists there present who were the people at the spiritual core of these communities. They might be, they might be a blacksmith, they might be a, a principal of a school, might be a stockbroker. And the concept of embracing the other evolved for you from there? It, it did indeed, because I found people of all stripes and persuasions. Mm -hmm. And I, I discovered racism. And, and, and I, I discovered sexism. And I, I found people trying to live according to the dictates of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, ordinary people, and in the three years that I did that, I learned more and differently and better the real importance of the American experiment than in the three years, which were extraordinary years, of studying with Daniel Boorstin at the University of Chicago. So, so why is the concept of embracing the other so vital to your I, existence? I, 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 I think that To me personally, as I say in the story that I've written, I, I lived in now, my young life in a uh, outwardly very respectable family, and internally I was under, like 
the tyranny of my older brother, two years older than I, twice tried to kill me, once with a large boulder that aimed with malicious intent, another time with a knife. Uh, and he was a terribly troubled person, but to me he was a tyrant. And he put a bullet through his head in Golden Gate Park about 11 days before or after, you know, his 19th birthday, and news greeted us in Toronto on Halloween. 1945. And I experienced that as a liberation from tyranny. And that was the trigger event for my gradual but lifelong attempt to right the ship and head it into a true north of authentic, authentic presence and so on. So Did you have I, to forgive yourself? for feeling that way about your brother? Is that? I, I did. Hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, it was through the trigger of <laughs> Borges' story, because I felt at one with him, uh, that I revisited it and, and have a practice now of two or three times a month of revisiting critical episodes from my past. And in, in, I inventory all of the sense experience of what did things smell like, what did, what did they look like, what they feel like, and so on. And I try as vividly as I possibly can to remember those circumstances. And then I learn from them. And one of the things that I found is that uh, I could forgive my brother, who I'd never forgiven. His shadow had never left me. I, and I wasn't aware of it. And it was corrosive to my soul. And so I found it in my heart to forgive myself for my triumphalism and him uh, for the sins, if you will, of a very tormented young man who would have been diagnosed in this day and age as ADHD bipolar, without a question. And I have a, a little sketch that somebody named Binnis Walter did of him uh, a few days before his death. And I have that in my little office in, in Santa Barbara. I see it every day, and I see the pain. I see the pain. Mm. And it's, so I, I've been able then to look at past adversaries and to realize that they were teaching me things that I had to learn. And I also learned that, that if I didn't get it from this adversary, the same issue was going to be presented in yet another adversary. And I must say that I had some marital misadventures, as she knew, and everybody's aware of this. And uh, I recognized the narcissism of each of the three very different women I married. I, was, uh, I took these marriages very seriously. One was 12 years and produced four remarkable children, including twins, now 61. And uh, then a second uh, uh, marriage that came the day after my uh, former wife married my most intimate colleague at, U at UCLA, uh, Donald Meyer, brilliant man and one of my closest friends <laughs> until that time. <laughs> <laughs> and then things changed somewhat. And, so and, we, we and, uh, wrap up. and then a third wife. And uh, that was uh, um, dissolving at about the time I met Sheena Patterson down there. And Sheena was the first person with whom I'd had any kind of intimate relationship, but absolutely no hidden agendas, absolutely straight arrow. And I have reported to her ever since. And she. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Keith, last question. Last question. No, I, and, I, and I'm saying this quite seriously. Mm. It has dawned on me gradually and ever more forcefully now as I'm re examining all of the fundamental assumptions that I've had through the course of my life uh, because the world is inside out and upside down and it calls into question many things uh, that I now believe to be fictions that have governed my actions. 
And uh, so I've lost the thread of that thought. I think it was there somewhere. But you, yeah, you were talking about embracing the other yeah. and how all these experiences have helped you to gather bits of yourself towards yeah. yourself yeah, and, 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 and heal them. Yeah, and the point that I, I, I wanted to make is this, that I have realized that throughout my whole life, the most important teachers I've had, the most important influences I've had, have been women. And I wasn't altogether aware of it as it was happening, but I'm aware of it now. And your, the relationship that we've had, that you alluded to earlier through the course of these extraordinary Good Life seminars, has been one in which I was the domineering older guy and you were the rookie, and so with on and so on. a lot to say. And even in, <laughs> with, well, I talk very much too much, as everybody in the world knows. But, but uh, and that, that, that was such an extraordinary seminar. Anne McNulty was in that seminar uh, at a very raw stage of her life. And it, it, it was a foundational it was seminar. A, it but, was a foundational seminar. Yeah. So Keith, our last question is, um, what is your wish for us? and your hope for what endures in this fellowship? Well, I think the legacy of Henry Crown, as it has, was conceived by Muriel and Francis Hoffman, uh, and as it has uh, developed over the course of these years, uh, under the tutelage of uh, this extraordinary partnership that, that Ben, Bernie, Dunlap, and, and uh, Skip Battle and I had. We are brothers. Uh, Skip is absolutely the brother that I never had. And uh, I cannot tell you uh, what a fount of knowledge and warmth and love has come from those two sources. And, and I think we would all say it's one of the greatest partnerships that we have ever had. And, I, and then for Peter and for all of these things, and I think of the fellows themselves. I, so let me tell you this. You. My hope yeah. is that the capacity to love unconditionally uh, will become uh, one of the watchwords of every person in this fellowship. And I will confess to you that at the beginning of that enterprise, I thought this the most unlikely thing for me to be able to practice, but I took seriously the idea that I would endeavor to love unconditionally every member of this fellowship. And I thought I was going to do it for two or three years. It was a turnaround. And uh, very early in that process, with the inaugural class, there was all kinds of magic dust sprinkled when they came together. But very early in that, I realized that there were two or three of those people uh, who I uh, found somewhat off-putting on sight. <laughs> and so, so what to do about that? I, I, of course, went as I got as close as I could possibly get to them. And in every case, over all of the seminars that I've moderated over all of these years, and there are many, I have been able to establish a knowledge of the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of the people I've been in contact with and to love them unconditionally. And the ones who I found off putting on sight in every case except two, <laughs> I just, I just, uh, you, you don't know who you are. <laughs> 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 but in every case but two, I found that the thing that pressed my buttons was a failing of my own that was made manifest in them and that spoke to me in a way, in a language that I couldn't understand until I did that Buddhist thing of getting into the, the heart of their pain. Thank you. I'm going to thank you now. Did I answer the question? Yeah, you did beautifully. I don't think you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Bowie. <laughs>